Hey everyone, Wolf Lord Row here. It's taken some time, but we are finally here. The War Master has arrived, and Horus Week is upon us. Oh yes. And it would only be appropriate to kick it off with a look at the true Horus Lupercal before he's fall to the temptations of chaos. And alongside his father, the Emperor of Mankind, no less. Spoiler warning to begin, the events we are discussing today are from the short story The Wolf of Ash and Fire by Graham McNeil. As always, I really recommend you read the story for yourself first, as that's the best way to enjoy the lore for yourself. Not only that, but we help to support the great Black Library and Games Workshop, because without them, we don't have all this great lore to talk about. I will put a link to the website in the description as always. But with that said, let's just jump straight in. Now these events take place during the Great Crusade, when Horus and the Lunar Wolves were tasked with eradicating the Greenskin Empire of the Orcs. But this was a tough fight, and the Orcs were putting up a strong resistance. Though the Lunar Wolves were winning, it was an arduous campaign. The key was to take out the Orcs' fortress world of Goro, and so Horus aimed to do just that. Yet when his fleet of Lunar Wolves arrived, even they were taken aback by the sheer size of the Orc forces arrayed against them. The Greenskin fleet is vast, and at its centerpiece, a hollowed out asteroid fortress, just bristling with guns and weaponry. The engagement became a slugfest, with each side just unleashing all hell upon the other. The vengeful spirit of course in the heart of the carnage, broadsides firing, its hull shaking with the amount of impacts it's receiving. This is not going well. Aboard the bridge, even the Lunar Wolves themselves are conceding things do not look good. If only they had another fleet, a hammer to their anvil. Horus simply replies, what do you want me to do? Conjure one from thin air? And of course, that's exactly what he does. You wanted another fleet, said Horus. I give you one. Space parted as though cut open by the sharpest edge. Amber light spilled out, brighter than a thousand suns and simultaneously existing in many realms of perception. The blade that cut the void open slid through the passage it had made. But this was no blade. This was a void-born colossus of gold and marble. A warship of inhuman proportions. Its prow was eagle-winged and magnificent. Its length studded with vast cities of statuary and palaces of war. It was a starship but a starship unlike any other. Built for the most peerless individual the galaxy had ever known. This was the flagship of the Emperor himself. The Emperor's fleet is absolutely massive and just starts absolutely obliterating the Orcs. Lance fire and thousands upon thousands of torpedoes, just ripping the Greenskins to pieces. Horus, having been waiting for this moment, immediately presses the Lunar Wolves forward, and within an hour, the entire Orc fleet is in ruins. As a Vox transmission hails the vengeful spirit. Permission to come aboard, my son, said the Emperor. The Emperor comes aboard with 300 of his Legio custodies, and is met by 10,000 cheering Lunar Wolves for not one of them was going to miss this reunion, orders or not. Jagatai taught it to me, said Horus in answer to a question of the Emperor's. He called it the Zeo. I can't pull it off anything like as fast as the Warhawk, but I make a passable fist of it. Sejanus saw Horus was being modest, not enough to keep pride from his voice, but just on the right side of arrogant. You and Jagatai were always close, said the Emperor as they marched between the proud lines of Lunar Wolves. Of all of us, even me. 
I think you know him the best. And I hardly know him at all, admitted Horus. It is how he was made, said the Emperor, and Sir Janus thought he detected a note of profound regret. Ah, Horus, always teetered on that fine line between supreme confidence and arrogance. But it's great to see here more of the natural relationship between Horus and the Emperor, the father and the son, helping to plant the seeds of why the Emperor struggles to destroy Horus in their fated encounter. Here we have Horus seemingly answer what must have been just a simple question from the Emperor about the tactics from the battle, just shooting the breeze with Horus upon their reunion, not just orders. And then the reference to Jagatai. We know obviously that Jagatai remains loyal, but even here, there's that element of doubt laid, even in the Emperor's own words. Of all of us, even me, I think you know him best. And the regret or sorrow in the Emperor's voice at being how Jagatai was made. Now of course he doesn't regret making Jagatai, and I don't think he even regrets how he made him, because he knows all the Primarchs fulfill a needed role, and have taken aspects of himself. I think the regret you hear is most likely the Emperor's regret in having been unable to get to know his own son. That despite it all, despite creating him and knowing how he was made to be, he's still been unable to truly connect to him. I really hope we get some kind of moment of true connection between Jagatai and the Emperor before the end, or at least just a moment where you feel they both accept the connection as father and son. The Emperor and Horus begin to walk through the cheering masses, making their way through the vengeful spirit and continuing their conversation until the Emperor stops. In the avenue of glory and lament, the Emperor kneels beside a memorial of names. The dead, asked the Emperor, and Sir Janus heard the weight of uncounted years in that simple question. All those where the spirit was present, said Horus. So many, and so many more yet to come, said the Emperor. We must make it all worthwhile, you and I. We must build a galaxy fit for heroes. We could fill this hall a hundred times over, and it would still be a price worth paying to see the crusade triumphant. I hope it will not come to that, said the Emperor. The stars are our birthright, said Horus. Wasn't that what you said? Make no mistakes and they will be ours. I said that? You did. On Cophonia when I was but a foundling. The Emperor stood and put a mailed gauntlet upon Lupercal's shoulder, the gesture of a proud father. Then I must prove worthy of your trust, said the Emperor. I think this passage really helps to highlight the glaring difference between the Emperor and Horus. The Emperor is clearly mournful of the lives spent in his name. You so often hear of the heartless, uncaring Emperor who wipes out tools after being useful. The Warlord, who led a crusade across the stars. And yes, all is true, but there can be no doubt. He's doing it for the entire species of man, for humanity, and he truly laments the loss of any human life. So many, and so many more yet to come, said the Emperor. We must make it all worthwhile. Whereas Horus's response really sums up his character. We could fill this hall a hundred times over, and it would still be a price worth paying to see the crusade triumphant. Now, yes, the argument could be made that the sentiment is true. It may well be worth paying that price, but there's definitely a callousness to it, a lack of humanity, if you will. In some ways, it highlights Horus's greatest strength, he will do whatever it takes to win, no matter the odds and no matter the price. But how can that attitude not be his undoing? To pay any price. How differently would that conversation sound were it with Vulcan instead of Horus? The cost of life. Wouldn't that be a great short story to read? Horus and Vulcan together on a campaign in the Great Crusade. The differences on outlooks the foreshadowing of Horus's future. 
But then that last line, that I must prove worthy of your trust. Oh, the irony. The heresy basically happened due to Horus not feeling he was trusted, that he was lied to. And here the Emperor seeks to be worthy of his son's trust. Hours later, the call for war sounds out, and the Lunar Wolves begin the assault on the planet below. Drop pods and stormbirds in the tens of thousands descending upon the planet's surface. Lupercal watched his warriors race to battle from the golden bridge of his father's vessel. He wished he was part of the initial wave, the first to set foot on Goro's alien surface, a wolf of ash and fire, bestriding the world as an avenging destroyer god. Destroyer? No, never that. An interesting note there, Horus corrects himself on the fault of being a destroyer, but not God. Man, the more you read of Horus, you really wonder if the heresy could ever have been avoided. It raises the question of how much his personality was just him, and how much came about from being the lone son under the Emperor for all those years, and gaining that feeling of entitlement. You wish you were with them, don't you? Asked the Emperor. Horus nodded, but didn't turn from the viewing bay. I don't understand, said Horus, feeling the might of his father's presence behind him. What don't you understand? Why you wouldn't let me go with my sons, said Horus. You always want to be first, don't you? Is that so bad? Of course not, but I need you elsewhere. Here, said Horus, unable to mask his disappointment. What good will I do from here? The Emperor laughed. You think we're going to watch this abomination die from here? Horus turned to face the Emperor, now seeing his father was girt for battle, towering and majestic, in his gold-chased warplate of eagle wings and bronze mantle of woven mail. A blue steel sword was unsheathed, rippling with potent psychic energies. Custodians attended him, weapons at the ready, upon the largest teleporter array Horus had ever seen. I believe you call it a spear tip, yes? Said the Emperor. Oh snap, the Emperor of Mankind and Horus Lupercal about to lay some serious smackdown on the Greenskins. It's always an awesome moment when you know the Emperor himself is about to go to war. I mean, let's be honest, you would be hard pressed to get a more goosebump tingling moment than when the Emperor joins the Custodes in battle in the Master of Mankind, upon the throne itself, as the generators around the chamber hummed louder. The Emperor of Mankind opened his eyes. And you just know it's about to go down. How could you not follow this guy into battle? He's not messing around, he's not directing orders from his ship, letting others do all the work and risking their lives. He's leading the MFing spear tip himself. Let's get this straight. The Emperor of Mankind, Horus Lupercal, and 300 custodies. I mean, even I'm starting to feel sorry for the orcs. But that's it for today, guys. Oh, teaser. I know. How could you do this to us, Ro? Well, fear not. It is Horus Week, after all. What are your thoughts on these glimpses of the true Horus Lupercal before his fall to the Dark Gods? Or do you think his fall was always going to happen? And how about his interaction with the Emperor? As always, drop your thoughts in the comments below. I love to read them. A huge thank you to all my subscribers. Your support really means a lot to me. It truly does. And if you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too. But with that said, I am off and I'll see you all again real soon.